Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Saturday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and today is the 14th of July, and we can choose to celebrate either the Bastille Day in the French Revolution or John Keeble Day and the warning against apostasy. So we're going to go with the latter. Um, I think it's going to be fun to talk a little bit about John Keeble Day. <laughs> Uh, p- people who watch the show certainly know that July 14th was the launch of the Oxford Movement in England, and it's something interesting to talk about because, um, if anything, it's a response to what was happening in Europe uh, in regards to Christianity. Um, Oxford Movement, tell me what you know. Well, so on this day in 1833, John Keeble preached uh, his famous sermon against national apostasy in uh, in St Mary's Church in Oxford, and it launched the beginning of um, of, of the, I think the second attempt to renew mm-hmm. the Church of England. The first one was Wesley, which which was quite incredible. Um, uh, the second attempt, uh, Keeble did something. It looks almost unthinkable. As uh, in in my morning prayer this morning on Facebook, we we read from his sermon, uh, and I was astonished at how powerful it was. He was effectively accusing the English betri- people of of betraying the God who had given them their freedoms, because fifty years ago the French Revolution had launched a a utopian movement, uh, and effectively, as so often in the affairs of the Church, had provided people with a choice between two ways one way was save yourselves on your own terms and the other one was be faithful to the lord your god this is the same dynamic as we have all the way through the old testament uh, and 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 whenever people are faced with a choice god raises up prophets to speak prophetically to the people and and this sermon was was enormously powerful that a that a senior uh, priest and poet would have the courage to say to the English people who thought a great deal of themselves in the 1830s, you have betrayed the Lord your God. And and our, what is our duty, he said, as Christians? Our duty, first of all, is to pray to, for you and not just to condemn you. But having prayed for you, we'll do our duty, which is to witness and speak to you on God's behalf. Um, I think if we could have gone back to John Keeble and said, you don't know what apostasy even meant. <laughs> the apostasy, if you had had your children being inducted into into um, LGBT issues, if you had had people standing on the on on the front of St Paul's reading from the Bible and the staff of St Paul's calling the police to close them down, uh, Keeble, dear dear man, you don't know how bad apostasy can get, but we know, and so it's it's fitting we should recognise his contribution and his call to repentance today. Well, we do know, you know, a couple hundred years out now, but what's it going to be like in a couple hundred years for us uh, um, looking forward? It's certainly, um, we, we say it's bad. We see all the LGTB uh, rights activists. We see the uh, liberal activists uh, all throughout uh, England and Europe just causing havoc left and right by not allowing the other side to speak. Um, if well, we, in, if later we, on in our if, program. Yeah, if, if we lose our voice do we lose everything uh i think we do uh, we lose as good as everything later on in in this program we'll talk about two christians who in the last week have been closed down and lost their jobs mm-hmm. uh because of lgbt pressure i mean in one sense this is nothing new it's just that the numbers and the profiles are growing all the time and when, you know we began i think by saying shock horror um appealing to common sense appealing to natural justice how how can this be look what's happening surely not and, and we're now beginning to see it begin as a deluge and our my sense is our tone of voice is, is changing and instead of shock horror we're saying actually this is really terrible mm-hmm. and the consequences are uh, are enormously serious if we lose our voice in the public space we can't evangelize now the trouble is we haven't been evangelizing for the last 50 years we we know we should have been and all credit to those who have but the cost of speaking out on behalf of the gospel of the ten commandments of the judeo-christian ethic and tradition is now exponentially high we didn't do it when it was easy how are we going to do it when it costs now i was watching watching reading the news last night on daily mail and i saw these pictures of huge crowds in england um gathering together to welcome trump uh, who's visiting your country this week? Wait, you're li- I, I, I have that wrong, huh? 
What, 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 what is the response to Trump's uh, visit to England, Gavin? They were certainly stimulated by his arrival, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, um, they were there to protest against him. And uh, again, this is this terrible division of society. Half our society is pro-Brexit, so we can govern ourselves, have our own Tea Party and Revolution for Independence. And the other half wants to belong to this increasingly un anti-democratic um, uh, block and and a, a number of people in this country are very impressed with Trump uh, he appears to be delivering on what he said he's delivering on employment he's delivering on immigration he's asking questions about uh, Islamic the Islamic commitment to terrorism but there are a whole group of people who almost as if they belong to a different emotional tribe who who hate him Mm -hmm. So they've been there've been examples of people being asked in the street, "Why are you here on this anti-Trump rally?" And then they spew hate. They accuse him of hate, and they hate him for the hate they're accusing him of. But actually, they they accuse him of of, of vague tropes like, well, misogyny and bullying. They say sure. and, and, and racism. Um, and it's one thing to have public idiots, the, the crowd, the mob, do this. But, but one of our bishops, the leading LGBT activist, Paul Bayes, is a whole spew of, of, of gross anti-Trump tweets yesterday. So he said, uh, Trump thinks of behaving this capricious, inconsistent way. He's a smart deal maker. In fact, he presents as a vacuous bully. And then he has these really offensive pictures of the Trump blimp that um, the, the mayor of London saw fit to give permission to. And you, you think you think that you think that a bishop would would manage some kind of public continence, but in fact he weighs in, using the same contempt and and hate and uh, and and, and uh, unmonitored language um, that that some of the more uh, ill-informed and frankly ignorant well, people I, of the street do. I, I saw an interview with uh, your your mayor in London, and he was asked. Uh, if you know why he approved the the trump bl uh, blimp blimp trump baby trump i'm not going to show a picture of it it's pretty bad um and he said listen you know we have the freedom of speech here in uh london and there's not not much i can do about it i mean i suppose i could go and you know try and get the police to to you know do something but we really respect freedom of speech in this city and in england as a whole and i need to call bs on that okay uh, he just a few months ago had no problem having Christians arrested uh, for street preaching, for doing all the things they want to do just by reading uh, gospel verses. And I'm like, that's pretty hypocrite, uh, you know, pretty bad. I think the jury, the jury is out on Trump as a politician, and there's no doubt he's a colorful character. Um, who uh, has his own particular approach to problems. It seems his major approach is to go in swinging his fists and then becoming more emollient when he's actually face to face with the people. But if, but, but if that works, uh, then well, one you, has to you, test you say the jury's out, but every issue he's fighting over here and winning are the same issues you guys are fighting over there. Um, the immigration, yes, I the think unemployment, I, um, dealing with the politics of the day um, if you've ever seen politics, there's nothing like the parliamentary system uh, to, you know, make you vomit about politics. I think what I'm trying to do is to, to avoid doing the equal and opposite mistake of Paul Bayes. Okay. Um, I'm very I'm very interested in what Trump is doing, and sure. and I wouldn't be surprised if he succeeded hugely more than Obama succeeded in in the goals that each have set each other. Um, I, I'm I'm slightly hesitant to to say, well, you know, if if uh, Trump makes Khan and the and the publicly left idiots un, unhappy, then I then I'll I'll support him for it. But uh, but I'm certainly supportive of respecting the president of the United States uh, and giving him some space and some time to see what he can achieve. I recognise that Trump's he, he's an eccentric businessman with a colourful past, but he ought to be given the opportunity without our engaging in the hate speech. And that's where you're exactly right. Uh, it, it's the hypo hypocrisy is the left have no trouble with hate speech against Trump. Mm -hmm. They just have trouble with with what they perceive as hate speech against their own interests. So so we and then the danger is 
that they're using the law against those they accuse of hate speech, which are usually, in this case, almost exclusively Christians. Well, even Canon Andrew White put out a, a Facebook post, you know, welcoming the president, saying, God bless America, uh, this is great trade for Britain. And I'm like, you know, th this is true. Well, I, I was very excited when I saw Trump offering us a trade deal, mm -hmm. because actually, if uh, if we have to choose between trading with with the Europeans and trading with America, um, I'm very pleased indeed that we've got rid of Obama saying, uh, hey, you guys can go back to the back of the queue. I'm going to see you're punished. Mm -hmm. And instead, we have free trade America saying, if you want to trade with us, we'd like to trade with you. Just make sure you don't tie yourself too much in the up in the hands of the Europeans. So, so personally, uh, I think that's a... a a great way forward. I I don't know how much we can rely on what Trump says publicly, because it's true. One day he'll say one thing, and another day he'll say another thing. Mm -hmm. Which is partly what I meant by saying, let's let's judge him on what gets delivered. Sure. If in a year's time we discover that we're offered a very favourable trade deal with America, when the Europeans are throwing a hissy fit and threatening us with 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 make economic meltdown, then I think everyone will have a reason for being very grateful to Trump. Well, before we had the election here for Trump, um, which was obviously a surprise election, there was a vote for Brexit to leave the European oh. Union. What is taking so long? <laughs> I, I mean, it should not be that difficult to sign a couple of contracts and begin anew. I think that the, the difficult, so there, there are two ways of, there's a pro-Brexit and anti-Brexit way of describing this. The pro-Brexit way is, look, this is all red tape. You can just cut it. If if you have autonomy, walk away. They need your money more than you need their regulations. Correct. Um, so call the bluff and walk. Uh -huh. Then the, the anti-Brexit view is, look, everyone's involved in red tape. I have a friend of mine who's a, a lawyer involved in the, he's one of the world-class uh, nuclear lawyers. And he says, you've no idea how complicated nuclear law has become uh, and 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 all the regulations that we have uh, entered freely into engage with the complexities of european law and actually we're not finding any easy way of simply cutting through the red tape uh, there are aspects of corporate life where you can cut through it and frankly other aspects where when you interfere with it it becomes incredibly complex and really quite dangerous now he's anti-brexit so I don't know if I should trust him or not in what he says. I don't know if in the nuclear industry, again, you can simply walk away. But I, I can imagine, I think the real question is, is there a will to solve it? And the problem is at the moment, that because the Europeans want to punish us, there is no will for them. They'd be happy to see us fail. So my own personal instincts are, I believe in freedom and autonomy. I don't like being bullied. And uh, I absolutely, I have always resented our loss of national sovereignty. I'd be perfectly willing to take two or three years of, of an economic winter in order to free ourselves from people who do not have our own national interests at heart. But that's a personal point of view. Well, it's interesting because once they you, you have this joint economy, they want to have joint morals and joint moral laws and joint moral code. And all of a sudden, you know, you're uh, funding abortions in Africa and Asia and that wasn't part of this plan. This, we, we didn't agree to this. No, you really did. Um, I want to move on a little bit. This is before our time. But a long, long, long time ago, on, on the streets of London, it was against the law to have a Bible printed in English. Shame on us. Uh, we've come back you know, a couple hundred years. It's just perfectly fine to have those Bibles. Now it is against the law, from what I read in papers, to preach outside St. Paul's in London. Kevin, I used to look at street preachers uh -huh. with a mixture of admiration and contempt. Sure. Uh, the admiration was, my goodness, these people have, the, have, have Jesus on their mouths in the public space. How on earth do they do that? And the contempt was, what is it with them that they need to do this in the public space That's where right. people are not listening to them but avoiding them? Now, um, context is everything. I, I now look back with admiration and a certain amount of, of um, nostalgia on all the street preachers I've seen because 
they were doing what they thought God had created them for. There's this wonderful prayer by Newman that says each of us has been made for a particular task nobody else can do. And we have to look at the street preachers and say, you were raised up by God to speak about Jesus in public. And whether or not I think it's effective doesn't matter. Uh, that's what you were made to do and you've done it. God bless you. One only really realizes the, the power of this when you can't do it. It's like um, it's like that Joni Mitchell lyric, uh, you only recognize something when it's gone. It is astonishing to me that, that somebody should stand in the environment, in the environs of St. Paul's Cathedral, reading out from, from the Bible. Uh, it is a very beautiful thing to read the Psalms out in public. Um, there are some wonderful parts of the Bible that could, could beautifully be declaimed as, as poetry and as wisdom. Right. In this particular case, a man stood and read from the Bible and just that in public, and a policeman came along and, the, and, and told him to shut up. And the guy said, is it illegal to read from the Bible in public? And the policeman said, well, look, frankly, I don't have a problem with this. I'll tell you the people who have a problem with it. They're the Christian staff in St. Paul's Cathedral. They've asked me to shut you up and move you on. And, and if you don't, I'll arrest you for the breach of the peace. And so this brave man said, you better arrest me. So, well, now I, let's, let's let the viewer know, you know, 500 years ago, St. Paul's had Christians arrested for reading the English Bible. This is history repeating itself. <laughs> in a very different context and for different reasons, but it is. And so no wonder, which brings us back to John Keeble and National Apostasy Day. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is apostasy for, for the, the people who run a Christian cathedral to shut down people reading from the scriptures outside the cathedral. It is something they ought to be profoundly ashamed of and repent. And if actually the Church of England has come to a point where its, rep, its public representatives, the people running the most public face of the church in the country are behaving like that, there really is something deeply wrong with the kind of Christianity we practice. All right, let's finish up here and talk a little bit about replacing your eye patch for some crutches. Uh, okay, before we go, oh, but, you, but before you, we do, yeah, just well, I I just think we need to mention the the two people who um uh who've been fired uh this this last week. Okay, what, uh, there's, what, there's what a, happened? Well, there's a doctor, David McCarrith. He's uh, been a doctor for 26 years, and he was uh, applying for a job as a medical assessor mm -hmm. for the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, and he was given a trick question. How would you refer to people who are transgendered, seeking a disability? And he said, as a doctor, I believe your gender is set by your biology. It's about your genitals and your chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And they said to him, then you're fired. Get out of here. The interview is finished. Well, and they didn't guillotine him. What's your problem, Gavin? <laughs> he's, he's been fired and he's no longer allowed to work as a doctor. <laughs> the, the difficult thing is, he says, I'm surrounded by um, a lot of doctors who believe, as I do, that gender is a medical sure. uh, issue and not, uh, not a political or cultural one. But he said they dare not speak out on my behalf. Then a, a couple of days earlier, there was a, a Christian pastor who stood as a mayor in County Durham. And uh, he has got a Facebook account in which he's been talking about his own commitment to the gospel and a, a drag queen. Uh, his name is Richard Smith. He was a mayor in Ferry Hill in County Durham. And a, dra a local drag queen discovered that on his Facebook, he has, face he has posts uh, critical of LGBT culture. Okay. So the local drag queen whipped up a, a mob and in the face of the mob, they threatened him and his family. And he then said, I, I, can't, I can't stand for a public position as mayor of my local community, even though I was elected to it democratically. So um, so he's resigned. There's no money involved. It's a matter of uh, of honor and public service. Yeah. But but simply in, in a week, both the uh, formal government departments uh, mandated to carry out an LGBT agenda on the one hand, and, and then the public mob on the other have removed two Christians from office. It's it's the beginning of a far deeper and longer process. And and we need to keep on responding, not 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 so much with outrage. But I think what we need to say to the people we live amongst is you may or may not like the gospel, you may or may not believe in Jesus, but you too have a need for freedom of speech. You will need people to speak out the truth in the public place. 
And if you allow Christians to be closed down like this, uh, then your own room for freedom of expression and freedom of speech will be seriously curtailed. Yeah, I, so this, I, again, this matters enormously. I do not see the Church of England taking any position on this at all. I don't see them screaming, hey, we need Ndaba, we need both sides to speak here. Um, th that doesn't exist at all in this context. No, the Church of England remains completely silent mm -hmm. on this use of, of freedom of speech in this, in this regard. That's right. Okay, so, so you're not going to be a pirate anymore. You're going to be uh, a captain <laughs> am, to, with one John leg. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, right. I'm, I'm John Silver with <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my eye patch for for uh, for, for nostalgia's sake and, and wear it with crutch. Um, yes, the, the the good news is well, they keep on changing my operation. I, until this morning, I thought it was on Tuesday, but today I've been told it's Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 very grateful. To be having it and one of the things that happens in this country is the nhs is so overstretched that if you go in for an operation and there's a road traffic accident you can be bounced out of theater because they obviously need sure. to deal with people who are facing life and death situations so perhaps i, I should be grateful it's a day later but it's 8 30 in the morning and um uh i i i, I said to occupational therapy can you give me four strong men to wheel me up the hill? Because I live on top of this big slope in a valley. And they said, um, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is, no, you can't have four strong men. The good news is, uh, we, we will, we'll have you walking in the hospital before you leave. And oh, so, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you, you'll have to do it on your own. So uh, th th this time next week, Kevin, I, I could be... And I mean, the viewers don't know what my drive looks like, but it's it. You can't get a car up it; it's too steep. So oh, no. I shall be, uh, I shall be, yeah, getting getting some friends together just to um, give me moral support as I as I head up it a few days well, after the operation. So we we certainly ask for viewers to to give uh, Gavin some prayers as he has surgery on Wednesday, eight thirty there. But that's about uh, uh, sometime in the early afternoon here. So please, please do that. I think uh, I think early morning. I think. Good. All right. What? Yeah. Even I'm better. Sorry. I'm doing the opposite. Be people can pray in their sleep. <laughs> uh, yes. Before you go to bed Tuesday night, please pray for Gavin's hip and recovery. Oh, jeez. How did they get grateful. that screwed up? Yeah. I'm, time zones. I'm still screwed up after Jerusalem. Uh, oh, it takes a while. It does. It, it, it's something else because it's okay. It's okay to travel someplace for three or four days, but when you you, you devote a whole week to it. And you uh, adopt that time zone, it's over. You know, flying it takes back. Quite is, a while to recover. Yeah. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 421 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>